Neo's conversation with his boss is chock full of hidden symbols. The software company he works for is called Metacortex, meta meaning transcending, and cortex meaning the outer layers of the gray matter of the brain, fully translating to transcending the boundaries of the brain. Pretty ominous foreshadowing there. His boss, Mr. Reinhardt, actually lays out the very quality of the one for the audience. You have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. The time has come to make a choice, Mr. Anderson. While this is happening, Neo is constantly being distracted by the window washers, whose suds in the window resemble the Matrix code. Already, Neo can read the code in the world around him. He just doesn't know it yet. The Matrix code actually appears in many other scenes as water and rain. In fact, the very sound of the code is of digitized raindrops on glass. It's also noteworthy that Mr. Reinhardt's appearance resembles that of Agent Smith. He is also the only other character that refers to Neo as Mr. Anderson. You have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. The time has come to make a choice, Mr. Anderson. There are two important room numbers seen early on in the film. First is Neo's apartment, which is room 101. Not only is this machine binary code, but it also harkens back to the infamous torture room in George Orwell's 1984. Also, if this wasn't already obvious enough, he becomes the one. Meanwhile, Trinity is first seen in room 303. This is an interesting play on Neo's room and establishes a subconscious connection between the two. This is also the very room where the film begins and the climax ends. Another thing to note is that Neo and Trinity's names are both highly symbolic. Neo, meaning new, is also an anagram of the word one. The name Trinity, of course, has a very religious connotation, but it also encompasses the three stages of Neo, unawakened pod person, hacker within the matrix, and an enlightened god who can manipulate the world around him. Morpheus is a Greek mythological character who is the god of dreams. How fitting, as he is one of the most powerful characters in this dream world of the Matrix. Cypher is an easy one, as he is the Judas of the story. His name, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is a method of transforming a text in order to conceal its meaning. And conceal his meaning he does. In the film's presentation, Switch just sounds like an electronic apparatus, but the Wachowskis originally envisioned this character as both male and female. Within the Matrix, Switch's mental projection of her digital self is female, but in the real world, it is male. And whenever jacked in, the character's gender would switch. But this was changed, probably to avoid convoluting an already complex world and plot. But I am curious how this would have played with audiences. The purely human Zion-born characters of Tank and Dozer ironically have machine names. Their bodies are also depicted as very well-built and utilitarian compared to the usually scrawny physique of the pod-born people. The agents have incredibly vague names like Smith, Brown, and Jones. This ties into their omnipotent an an anonymity and omnipotent anonymity. God damn it, Robert! That's a really hard fucking sentence to read. Their omnipotent an 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 this ties into their omnipotent anonymity and their ability to appear everywhere and as anyone. Yes! Finally, the name of the ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, has a religious connotation with the king of Babylon who destroyed Jerusalem and exiled the Jews. Perhaps my favorite symbolic scene is the illegal software trade where Neo, emerging from room 101, talks to the girl with the white rabbit tattoo. Neo keeps his software in Jean Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation which was required reading for the cast in order to understand the philosophy of the script. He keeps his software in the chapter on nihilism, which is a philosophy in which existence is senseless and useless. Sound familiar? There is another connection here as this book includes the phrase, Desert of the Real. Sound familiar? Welcome to the Desert of the Real. So far, the scene is throwing many visual symbols at us. But check out this densely brilliant dialogue. You're my savior, man. My own personal Jesus Christ. Yeah, I know, this never happened. You don't exist. It's called masculine. It's the only way to fly. Look, it just sounds to me like, you know, you need to unplug, man. Whoa. What follows is the club scene that begins with the Rob Zombie song, Dragula, but then dissolves into a prodigy song with the most appropriate title of all, Mindfields. <laughs> Fields. 
Also, don't forget that the ending song of the film is Wake Up by Rage Against the Machine. Even the film's excellent score by Don Davis is full of orgasms. I mean enigmas! He utilized anagrams of the words The Matrix and Wachowski Brothers to name tracks like Exit Mr. Hat, Threat Mix, Bow Whisk Orchestra, and Switch or Break Show. Over the course of the trilogy, the opening keys of the score increase a half step, the first film being in the key of E, reloaded in F, and finally Revolutions in F sharp. And this list is by no means exhaustive. There are far more symbols embedded throughout the film that we haven't even touched on. But it's qualities like these that give The Matrix an intense allure and a strong rewatch value. Of course, no movie is without sin, and this film is guilty of a few bad things. First is with the Trinity character. Excuse me. Now, before you freak out about what we're about to say, there's no denying that this is one of the most badass characters ever seen in the genre. After the 3 minute and 21 second mark, you are sure of one thing. You do not want to fuck with Trinity. Also, before we meet Morpheus, our trust is in the confidence of this character. She is the initial giver of exposition before she hands off the job to Morpheus. And I'd be lying if I said this is the point where she grows as a character. From this point on, she fulfills her main two roles the showstopper, and the love interest. She's able to be a tough person, sure, but the purpose of a character becomes kind of secondary. Don't get me wrong, she kicks a lot of ass, but most of the forward-moving action is perpetuated by Neo. You know, the new guy on the ship? Honestly, this whole thing is kind of a nitpick, but this will come into play far more when we get into the sequels, where Trinity is basically rendered useless. Another issue that deserves to be looked at are the number of cheesy moments that exist in the film, such as perfectly timed thunderclaps For our protection. From what? From you. Buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. Dramatic push-ins that make even Spielberg look subtle, and a love story that feels a little shoehorned in. In fact, the sequels actually try to justify this subplot by making it the key to their hidden narrative. Sure, love and our own human impulses are the keys to Neo becoming enlightened, but the fact that it feels like a mere secondary plot point is very weak. Another thing is that Neo has this irritating habit of asking a lot of one-word questions. When AI, Zion, Jiu-Jitsu, Squiddy, EMP, Source, Beginning. If this guy was on Jeopardy, he'd be screwed. A sentinel. Killing machine designed for one thing, search and destroy. Yes, Neo. Squiddy. I'm sorry, Neo, but your answer must be in the form of a question. Shit. And this is a fact. He never speaks more than two sentences throughout the film until his final monologue. Though this was likely intentionally done to convey his transition to an enlightened character. Boy, the seagull sure kept that up. No. And, of course, one could argue that the sheer amount of symbolism is a bit heavy-handed, especially after the first viewing. A big, however, though, the groundbreaking craftsmanship, gripping story, deep philosophy, intense, brutal action, and fresh aesthetic completely overshadow the minor flaws of the film, which is why it continues to be a success. Sadly, the same praise can't be used to describe the sequels. So now that we've looked deeply into the sublime first film of this trilogy, we can not only better understand the creative rigor of the Wachowskis, but also see why the following two films were considered a massive failure. However, could there be more to them than meets the eye? Tune in next time as we go deeper into The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revelations. I mean, revolutions.